get started in uh, doing stand up and comedy itself? Well, I, I, as a kid, I always wanted to be a comedian and I wanted to be a comedy writer. I didn't know how to go about being a comedian because when I was a kid, there really weren't comedy clubs. Um, that's how old I am. So, um, but I, but I knew that TV, you know, I love the Dick Van Dyke show. That was a big influence on me. And I knew that shows had, I know, I knew comedy I knew shows had writers. So, so I knew that was a thing. So, um, I, um, I used to, I, as I was a comedy nerd mm -hmm. and I would write jokes as a kid because I thought I might need them someday. So I would have li little note cards and I would write, if I thought of a joke, I'd write it down and I would collected these jokes. And sometimes I would just sit and write jokes. So I was like a teenager, you know, I'm 14 and 15 and 16 and I'm sitting writing jokes. And um, when I was in college, I was a sophomore in college, they had a comedy show at my school and I, one of the, the last comedian, this guy named Barry Crimmins, I thought he was great. This is, and I where, went, can, I, can I hold on? This is in the Boston area, Massachusetts? Yeah, I went, I went to Boston College. Okay. And so this is the first uh, live comedy show I'd ever seen. So they had some local Boston comedians come in. And uh, I went and talked to the headliner, this guy Barry Crimmins, who I thought was hilarious. And he ran a show in Cambridge called The Ding Ho. He ran a club there. In a Chinese restaurant. Chinese restaurant. So he, I met with him for a cup of coffee and I brought my joke, I typed up my jokes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and I showed him my joke, you know, and he kind of critiqued them for me or whatever. Um, and he said that you really can't make any money in Boston writing, you'd have to go on stage. And I was like, oh, I couldn't do that. You know, that was too terrifying. But he let me come to the shows for free. So I would come and watch. And uh, then I took a comedy class that summer at Emerson taught by Dennis Leary. Really? Yep. Leary, Leary taught a class at Emerson College? <laughs> yep. And he was, you know, he was probably, he was probably like 24. And I was like, nine, well, I, I guess I was 19. I, he was, yeah, he was probably like 24 and I was like 19. Did he have so, an, excuse me, did he have an academic background or is it, he was just a comedy was hot and he was a hot comic to have. Well, he was an uh, Emerson graduate, so he must have had some pull there for, for, you know, or connections there or whatever. So I don't know if he lobbied to teach, I don't know how that his class came about, but um, they had us write script, like sitcom stuff or whatever comedy stuff, and then to stand up in the class. And the last class we invited people in and, um, they kind of recommended that I should continue. So I went to do an open mic at the Ding Ho and my friend Crimmins happened to be the host, just sort of coincidentally. Right. So he gave me a good spot and a good intro and all this stuff and it went great. And then um, I went back the next week and bombed. <laughs> um, get on after midnight. And so I would go every other week, I'd do the Wednesday night show open mic. Um, and after about nine months, I started getting like little paid gigs here and there of like 20 bucks mm -hmm. to do 10 minutes or something. Um, and then I did that and I started getting gigs and then I graduated from college and I just, I lived at home and I just did stand up full time. Um, and then I, I moved out a couple of years later and I just uh, made a living, a meager living, but I made a living as a stand up uh, so I, don't want, I, don't want, I don't want to embarrass you about how old you might be, but we're talking about this is in the uh, mid eighties. Well, I'm, I'm fifty eight. Oh, so so this is so this would be during the boom, right? Yes, the, I, I was kind of lucky. Like I, I when I graduated, the boom kind of came about. So I was able to work every night, and and the beauty of work living in Boston was, you know, you'd have a gig up in Maine one night, and then the next night you'd be at a college in Western Mass, and then the next night you'd be at a club in Boston, and then you'd be at a one-nighter in Worcester, or whatever, you know what I mean? Right. So you were doing shows every night, and also 
you were doing a half hour every night. Right, right. So that's, a, you know, a half hour of stage time every night. Um, that, I, I think most of us, most of us today, even people who have been doing comedy for a while would kill to be able to do that, right? To get ahead. Yeah, right? absolutely. Every Absolutely, because most people are doing five minutes for years, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so you, so you progressed as a stand-up, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, eventually, I would imagine that you were um, you were on the road headlining. W w was that part of what you were doing, or did you? I, I, you know, I was mi mostly middling on the road. Okay. Um. So. Then I, I was just starting to headline when the boom sort of ended. So it was kind of like, and I had gotten on the Tonight Show a couple of times and I was actually making less money <laughs> because the boom kind of ended. And, um, and then luckily uh, I got hired at Conan then. Right. So, so let me ask you, let's take a step back. Um, how did you get your first, what was the first late night show that you actually did? Um, well, this is the crazy thing. My first, my first time on television, I, I was 25. They came in and to Cambridge and they auditioned a bunch of us. And it was for the CBS morning, CBS morning program. Really? Okay. So it was on opposite the Today Show. And what they did was they wanted to have comics do like two minutes. Okay. And it was in the morning, so it was it was even it was extra strict in terms of like you couldn't say suck or you couldn't say you know, so it was even stricter than late night, because late night now is pretty loose, but late night then was stricter, but but this was even stricter than that because it was in the morning, so um, I got picked to do that. So they I went to New York and they they taped a bunch of us in front of a, a live audience. And, the, and then what they did is they cut it up into two minutes chunks. And it was Marriott Hartley, and I don't remember the guy's name, but they would throw to it. And now we're time for comedy. And they would pretend that we were in the studio, but we weren't. Oh, okay. So that we would just come out and stand out in front of a curtain and do our act. Um, and I remember it was in TV Guide, the listing said, uh, Henry Kissinger, uh, actor Raymond Burr, funeral arrangements, and comedian Brian Kiley. <laughs> uh, did you keep that? I would frame that. <laughs> oh yeah, I, 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 sh I should frame that. It was, it was pretty funny though, I have to say. Uh, so so um, you did, the, your Tonight Show was after Carson? Or was it? Yes. Carson? Okay. No, so my, it's funny because my dream was always to do the Johnny Carson show. And I early on realized, you know what? I'm, I'm really not built to be a club comic. I'm really, I'm really trying to get on TV. Mm -hmm. So I really tried to work. I would work clean. I'd work TV clean and I would bomb in one nighters sometimes um, because that's how I, I wasn't what they wanted, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, so, but I, I took those beatings, you know, just because I had that, I had that goal in mind and I didn't want to let go of that, you know? Right. Okay. Um, and then I started getting on, like, I do evening at the improv or they did like Caroline's comedy hour. I did some of those A&E shows. The, the syndicated shows. The yes. Yes. Um, and I did a few of those. And then um, I had auditioned for The Tonight Show. I, I came out to LA and I auditioned and I had a really great audition. And um, Jimmy Brogan said, you're about three quarters of the way there. So he went through my set and he liked about, I probably had about 20, say 24 jokes in my set and he liked like say 18 of them. Really? But so, I, wait, so I went, I went back home. For the benefit, for the benefit of the people listening, uh, Brogan was uh, on the Tonight Show. Was he, was he actually booking the stand-ups, or was he a writer? He was. Yeah, he was booking the stand-ups. 
he was booking the stand-ups. I thought yeah. he was also a writer on the show as well. He was writing for the show, and, uh, and then, they, then they had him. And he was kind of Jay's right-hand man where he would go over the monologue with Jay. Right. Okay. I wanna, we'll get back to that in a minute, but keep going. Now. So uh, I went back home, and I you know, wrote new jokes. So I took the ones that he liked. And I put new ones in there <laughs> and I sent him a set and I came home one night from a gig and I listened to my answering machine and it said, yeah, I enjoyed this set. Let's, uh, let's book a spot. Okay. And I, I probably replayed that 20 times to make sure I wasn't misunderstanding what he was saying. I believe it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so you've, um, uh, since then, you've done uh, many uh, late night appearances. Not only you've also not only on Conan, but also on Letterman. Right, right. Well, it's kind of it's yeah. kind of funny. So I had I had auditioned for Letterman a bunch of times, and when I was twenty five, I auditioned for them, and I was just too nervous and whatever. But the producer came up to me afterwards and told me I was very good. And then I got on the show 17 years later. Uh, <laughs> that's all. That's all it took. That's all it took. And, and when I got on, what ha I, I got on kind of on a fluke because um, Dave got sick. Dave got shingles. Dave so got they shingles. Okay. So they called me up and... Um, it's one in the afternoon, I'm working at Conan. And Eddie Brill, who booked the show, right. he called me up, he goes, this is a weird question, can you do the show today? And I said, yeah, okay. He said, oh, I'll call you back. He said, he called me back, he goes, okay, you're on. Dave is sick, Bruce Willis is hosting. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> so they needed an extra act. So they didn't have enough, comp you know, so I, because Dave, Bruce Willis was supposed to be the first guest, he got bumped up the host and now they needed somebody. So I went over there and um, it was just, I just, you know, there was no like, okay, what are you going to do? Just, I just went and just did my best really? five. Really? And, was, yeah. yeah. And then when I got on a year later, you know, the intro said, this guy was on before and blah, blah, blah. And then I went on and did my set and Dave's like, I don't remember this guy. <laughs> 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 and he's like, well, you, were, you weren't here when he was here. So they would use me when somebody canceled. Right. So to give this some context, you were actually working in an adjoining studio or in a studio in the same building, weren't you at the time? No, uh, our studio. So they were at CBS. We were at NBC. Oh, so, he was at CBS at the time. Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So we were, uh, we were maybe a, a half mile away or something like that. Right. So, so Brill calls you up. Uh, I mean, you had a relationship with Eddie before this? Yeah. You know, he's a stand up and we had done a hundred shows together, you know? Right. And, okay. and, and I don't know how many people he called before me. He never told me that, but I'm sure. <laughs> it's probably true. <laughs> I'm sure he called a few and, the, and they were out of town or whatever. And so right. he, he was in a bind. So let me ask you on that note. How important is it to know people in this business? Huge, 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 huge. I can't stress it enough because here's the thing. You could be the funniest guy in the world and you live in Iowa and you don't know anybody in comedy. You're not going to be discovered because right. you know, there's no, there's no test. Like it's not like they, they put something in your arm and go, Oh, you measured a, 106 you're the funniest guy we've ever seen you know whatever it's not like that so you know i i do think being part of a comedy community is gigantic good yeah i, I would you agree know, yeah. when i started there was a guy from western mass who was a talented guy he was a handsome guy he did well on stage crowds liked him he really could have had a career, but he just moved back to Western Mass and no one ever heard from him again. Right, right. So, I, you know, I, yeah. It's interesting. I, I just saw something where um, Stephen Wright was explaining, I think this is in uh, when, when stand-up stood out, actually, 
where he talks about the fact that had, and I forget the guy's name, the guy who was booking Carson at the time had not had a son that was going to Harvard. Right. He would have never went to the Ding Ho or wherever he saw him. And yep. Wright would have never, it, his life might have went on an entirely different trajectory. Right. right, right. I mean, I think he, I think he would have been discovered eventually anyway. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, oh he, no. he, he, but he, I see, but absolutely, it was this kind of thing of, you know, th that just happens in life. There's, that it's how you meet your wife. It's how things happen. There's a lot of, there's a lot, there's a lot of, there's a little bit of luck involved too. There's a lot, absolutely. There's variables that all are, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so let's talk about your writing career, uh, your comedy writing career. You, so you started writing for Conan in 94? Yep. Uh, the Ides of March in 94, yeah. The Ides, so March 15th you started yeah. working for Conan, which, yeah, so you, did that worry you at all? Beware uh, of I, if you've noticed, I, I make a point to stay away from the Roman Senate. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm curious, did you, did you write at, were you known as a writer before then? Were you writing for other stand-ups or other TV shows? No, but you know, what's funny is, you know, as a comic, you have your strength and your weaknesses. And I would do a show, and even if I did well, I'd come off and another comic or some of the audience would say, you're a really good writer. And it was such a left-handed compliment because it's like, well, I wasn't handing out sheets of paper. Do you know what I mean? Yes. And I do think it, it, I was, it took me a, a long time to become comfortable on stage. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it depends. I, I shouldn't say that because sometimes, sometimes you go up and they like you right away and then, it's, and then it was fine. But if I had to struggle, it was like, uh-oh. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, it took me a long time just to be confident on stage. And people recommended acting classes, which I ended up taking just not to become an actor, but just to be more comfortable on stage and, and uh, that kind of stuff. So the, the, the joke writing came natural to me and I had been doing it for so long, even when I was a teenager, but I wasn't um, taking acting classes in high school or college or that kind of thing. Uh, I wasn't a theater kid or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Yes. So, yes. you know, I played sports and um, so I do think it's, I do think it's better to be, be very good at one thing as opposed to being pretty good at a bunch of things, if that makes sense. It does. It does. So, so you start um, being noticed for your writing by other standups. Yes. And um, now when did, uh, Conan did Conan take over Dave? He took over. He took over for Letterman. Letterman. Yeah, I know, but, but when did he do that? Did, was it before it, you? It, were there? It, yes, he started September of '93. So about six months. About six months before I started. That's kind of what I remember. And he and yeah. he and I, if I remember correctly, and because I'm 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 very close to age and you, as you, so I'm I'm an old guy too. <laughs> I'm not shaving it all off. I let it hang out. <laughs> the uh, uh, it was kind of it was kind of rough for him at first. I mean, oh he, yes, he wasn't yeah. a stand up per se. He worked on The Simpsons. Yes, and, yes, absolutely. And but, for that, but most people didn't really know who he was, and he didn't have his own. He didn't have his sea legs. It seemed like at first, right? No, no, and not for a long time. And when I started working there, you know, I only had thirteen week contracts. Oh. And they were constant. To this day, is that how it works? You only get thirteen. No, years? now I mean now it's like a year or whatever. But thank okay. God. But but in those days, you know, we were new, and there were constant rumors about the show going off the air and who was going to replace Conan. And would be reading the Daily News and the New York Post, and every day there was a new article about who was going to take over for Conan and so on. Right. So it was it was very shaky for the first couple of years. Right. So, so you, um, I'm, so I'm curious as to how you were approached or you approached the show to write for them. Well, what happened was um, some comics from Boston got hired initially. Uh, so it, Louis C.K. Yeah. and Tom Agna 
and then eventually Chuck Sklar got hired a couple months in. So I had all worked, I'd all done hundreds of shows with those guys in Boston. So they were looking for somebody to help write his monologue. And at the time, in those days, uh, not only was I writing jokes every day, I was writing topical jokes every day. Okay. So, and I would go on stage and do jokes from the newspaper. So. Sort of like, not, not like, more, you weren't Mort Saul. You didn't no, write. no, I wasn't, gonna, I wasn't bringing up the newspaper with me, but I'd, I'd write jokes in the morning and then I'd go up and do, you know, this happened in the news or whatever. Right. So um, I had all that practice of reading the paper and writing jokes from it, you know? So they asked me to submit a packet. So I, sub I typed up like 50 jokes and I sent it in. And then they said, you know, other people submitted. And um, they happened to like my packet and said, they called me and said, yeah, you start tomorrow. That simple. Did yep. You, okay. And it, was that a 13 week contract at that point where they? Oh yeah, yeah. It was yeah. 13 week contracts for years. Yes. But I thought I was just going to go do it for 13 weeks or maybe 26 weeks. And then that's it. And then just go on and move on to whatever else you might do. Yep. Oh, oh, shoot. What happened? Okay. It's okay. You're there. You're there. <laughs> I'm afraid to move. It's, it's all right. Uh, you know what? You might want to, because of what's going on, uh -oh. you might want to invest in sort of a little stand or something for your phone. Oh, that's a good idea. Uh, yeah. Okay. You don't have to do it now. It's a lovely okay. You got, wow, you got a lot of books. I do have a lot of books. <laughs> Sorry. I had, to, I had to sit here because I had to keep my phone plugged in because I didn't want it to die. Oh, yeah, it's cool. That's cool. And you're a Patriots fan? This is all Oh, uh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Sure. Oh, nice, yeah. Nice Sorry. Now, and everyone's leaving me. <laughs> you guys are all going to tune out. I'm so sorry. It's okay. Uh, so, well, you know what? I'm sure a lot of people here are curious about this, right? Because you said you submitted a writer's packet and... Was that it? It was just 50 monologue jokes that you sent, sent them? Yes, because they were just looking for a monologue writer. Right, because what you hear today, and let me say in New York, sure. uh, you know, the level that I'm at is that um, when you write a packet, a writer's packet usually needs to be monologue jokes, desk pieces, you know, with, uh, what they, right, like, right. somebody does like uh, thank you notes that uh, Fallon does, you know. He does the thank you notes. I'm sure you don't yep, watch. Them. Yep. I and, don't. <laughs> <laughs> and sketches, right? Um, but it's all particular to to a show. Now, do you um, believe me? If anybody actually does this, I'm going to kick their butts. But if somebody was going to submit to Conan, how does that work? Do, do they accept submissions like from they've never heard of you before, like a um, Okay. Generally, no, I think you, you would have to be recommended, recommended, you know, it, it's, I, um, so I'll tell you when we were, when Conan went to go host the Tonight Show, we were going to expand the staff. Right. So he went from three monologue writers to four monologue writers to six monologue writers. Yeah, okay. So we were taking a bunch of submissions and so I called up different comics that were friends of mine that were joke writers and said, hey, why don't you submit or whatever. But I also reached out to other, like, there was a guy, I, I was doing shows, a bunch of shows in New York. And whenever someone struck me as a joke writer, because other people, people can be very funny, but they're not joke writers. They're writing bits, they're doing, you know, they're doing rants or whatever, they're storytellers or whatever, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But people that were sort of one-line joke writers were kind of what we were looking for. So there's a guy, I didn't know his name, but I remembered some of his jokes. And I talked to this guy who booked this, it's like a weekly show. I said, who's the guy that does this joke and that joke? So he told me his name. I said, can I get a hold of him? So he gave me his email and I contacted this guy. And we had never spoken before. And he submitted a packet and he ended up getting hired. Wow. So it's like, maybe, and, but it was just, it was just on the strength of his jokes. It was a, it was perfect example of what you're talking about of being, putting yourself out there. I didn't know this guy's name, but I remember that joke and that joke. And so there, so there are Cinderella stories in this scenario. Yeah. And, and, he, and here's the thing where he's a guy that because he was going on stage and had great jokes, he got noticed, you know? 
Right, right. All right, so um, I, wanna, I don't want to take too much of your time. I do, I do have a couple of things that I wrote down that I wanted to ask you. Sure, sure, sure. The, uh, um, I asked most of them already. How, how, many, how many writers are currently on the show? Uh, now I think, I think there's like nine of us or something nine. like that. So before, you know, yeah, before the pandemic, yeah. uh, would you guys, you'd all physically meet together in the same office and work? Uh, yes. I mean, we, we all have our own little, uh, we all have our own little offices, but we would meet a couple times a day. Okay. You know, it was, it was a little different. Now there's just Lori Kilmartin, who's a great stand-up. Yeah, a- amazing. So her and I uh, are the only two monologue writers now. Okay. So Lori's writing as well. So she and I will write our jokes. We'll meet with Conan. Um, he'll pick the ones he likes and then um, give us some areas to write more jokes on. Right. And then we'll meet with them again. And... Um, then we'll meet with you know him and Andy and, and our head writer and we'll pick the jokes and he goes out and does them. Right. So when you and Laurie are writing, it's not like it's not like Lennon and McCarthy, is it? It's like McCartney. It's like you guys you write independently and then do you work? Yes. With each other? Yes. I mean, occasion. I mean, we will sometimes get together and brainstorm, but normally we just work in our each. We just normally work in our own offices or whatever. Right. And. And how many jokes would you say on average do you write for a sh- for each show? Okay, well that's a good question. So when Conan was with the Tonight Show, the Tonight Show had the history of having a long monologue, so he felt like he was supposed to do a long monologue. So we were writing like fifty jokes a day. Fifty. 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 And that you would have confidence in that you'd be able to say, "Here, Mr. Conan O'Brien." Here are the 50 jokes I wrote today. I think they're funny enough to be in front of millions of people. So there were six of us doing that. So it's basically, he's looking at, he's going through like 300 jokes. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I mean. Yeah. So, you know, it's just, that was, that's just too many. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's too many for say. him, but it's too, like, it's just too many to sit and write 50 jokes every day. Because right. and here's the thing: they're all topicals, right? Most they're of all topicals. Yeah. And here's the other thing: if you write that many, you're you're not sort of finessing any of them, right? You know. And here's the thing: I noticed the days I have the most jokes, it's not my best day. Yeah. Because yeah. it's like, yeah, but there's a lot of shit there. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's because you're not crafting any. You, you're thinking of the first most obvious thing, so on. It's better to kind of ruminate. Don't go with the first thing that everyone thought of. Think a little deeper. Keep chewing, and then you come up with something unique and good. Right. And so, it, yeah. So when so when, um, so does Conan make all the final decisions as far as the monologue? In in in. He makes all the final decisions in charge involving everything. Everything. So the producers oh, yeah. have no real say. Hey, I, I, had, I had to run my kids' names by him. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, he's in charge of every facet of the show. So it, but but is he, he's not like, you know, I know he likes to do this in sketches, right? Where he's, he's a megalomaniac. And, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Like Andy Griffith in A Face in a Crowd, you know? Sure, sure. <laughs> I love that movie. <laughs> right, it's a great movie. But it's, uh, uh, I would imagine that he has his own chops, given that he worked on The Simpsons. Before yes, he- yes. And he, he will rewrite our stuff. He'll edit it out. He'll say, you know, you don't need this part. Let's ch- take it like this. So he'll do that with jokes, but he'll do that with sketches too, where we'll present a sketch at rehearsal. And he'll be like, all that stuff at the top, we can cut that. We can go right into this. That's the last part. Maybe you could end on this instead of that. You know, like he'll tweak everything. Right. right. So now let me, now again, I don't mean yep. to do that. But the, uh, is, it's, and I could be wrong because I, I don't watch a lot of TV. But the masturbating bear. <laughs> is that Conan? That's Conan, right? That was our show. Yes. I, I yeah. actually shared, it, I shared an office with the masturbating bear for 24 years. <laughs> you did? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so Conan sees this guy. He said, I, I, I'm interested in how that was pitched. Like, we're going to have a bear come out. <laughs> I, I think what happens is, so whoever pitched it in the meeting, it got a, it got a big laugh in the meeting. And then we presented at rehearsal. And it got a huge laugh at rehearsal. And then Conan's like, okay. So then when it came out, it killed on the show. And it's one of these things of the audience loved it. So we brought it back. And then we kept bringing it back because they always loved it. <laughs> and but, but also, it yeah. Right. But isn't, let me, let, I guess my point is, isn't that something that at a different time and place that may have never oh. gone on Oh, air? my God. Yeah. You know, it's funny because I, I was in public years ago. And somebody, some young person was talking to me and he's going, oh, guys, that sketch you did with the masturbating bear the other night was so funny. And this old black woman turned and looked at me and said, the masturbating, what? <laughs> she was so offended. It was so it, funny. It's, it's, um, it's got to be, it, it, it is a shockingly, but not, not like shock jock. Just yes. a very funny, funny bit. Well, if you, uh, it was a thing of, we've always had a very young crowd. And it was, we, were, we didn't have that, we didn't have the older Johnny Carson crowd. We had right. college kids. And yeah, so our stuff would be outrageous. And, you, you know. Kind of inherited, it, you, you inherited a Letterman's traditional audience, or the audience that, that Letterman built yes. with, or whatever, the Late Late Show, whatever he called the show. Yes. Um, yeah, because when I was in college, we all loved Letterman, you know. Right. So do, do you do you write to a particular demographic when you're writing for the show today? Um, because you're 58 and I'm sure, I, you know, I'm, I, if, if I'm going to watch a late night show, I'm usually going to flip to Conan, to be honest with you. Right, right. Well, I, Conan's 57. I do think, I, I do think, I, I don't say that we're writing for them in, in, in a sense, but We'll we'll try not to do references that you go. They're not going to get that. They're too young for that. Do you know what I mean? Got it. Right. So okay. we're conscious of that. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I I stopped watching all the late night shows. I always loved Letterman, and I stopped watching him even when I started because I didn't want to be influenced by the other shows. Imagine that's you know? true. Yeah, I would yeah. imagine that's true. Um, and and again, the masturbating bear. <laughs> Letterman and influence. Uh, Co he was very influenced by Ernie Kovacs. Right? Sure, sure. And 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 the absurd. There's a bit of yep. absurd going on, and I, I would imagine that's still going on in your uh, on your show. Where yes, I, I do think we try. You know, Conan has very. It's funny because when I first started, because you know he went to Harvard and he was this brilliant guy and so on. I thought it was going to. I was shocked at how silly he is. Yeah. And it was it was like, oh, I was not expecting this guy. Right. I thought it was gonna be all intellectual humor or whatever. No. Right. It's a bunch of Aristotle and fart jokes. Aristotle yeah. wrote the best fart jokes, right? That's true. That's true. <laughs> uh, well, Brian, I want I, I want to uh, before you go, I'd like to open it up to the group. Sure, sure. You don't mind. Uh, have, I'm sure that some of us have some questions for you. And um, if you do, let's, uh, you can unmute yourselves and let's just be orderly and not give Mr. Kylie a headache. So let's just be nice. Uh, Ziggy, oh, hello. Ziggy, uh, Ziggy, you want to say something? Ziggy had his hand up. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you were doing your stand up versus writing for Conan, were they basically the same jokes or was your stand up different than what you wrote for Conan? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I never wanted to have that dilemma of, do I keep this joke from me or give it to him kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? So what I would do is I gave him everything topical. So I, I lost about 25 minutes of my act right away, but I always just gave him everything topical and, and then I just wrote personal stuff from me. So then I started writing jokes about, you know, my kids and my wife and so on. Okay, that's a great question. I didn't want to have that conflict, yeah. How do you, so, so do you, do you, um, um, 
Do you separate those things physically? Like when you're in the office or on Conan's time, you only write for Conan? Yeah, yeah. On his time, I'm just writing for him. Yeah, I can't imagine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, if I, if I think it's something funny for me, I'll just jot it down. But, but I do that all the time. You know, I just keep a little note in my phone for later, you know? Well, you know, this is a good question because um, it's very highly recommended that people, um, they... Uh, keep a joke book, right? That they keep, yep. they, they have one repository where they try to keep all their, like Larry David's very famous for this, right? Yeah. Where yeah. He's even got episodes of his show where he loses his notebook and it's incredibly valuable and stuff. Is it, do you have it, what, what, what do you use as that repository? Well, it's funny because for years I just had those, like, like you're in junior high and just have these notebooks filled with jokes, you know, and I have, I have a couple of boxes of notebooks that are just filled with jokes. Uh, I did yeah. finally switch over to computer. And so I still have, a, I have files in my, on my computer, but I also, I have that little, um, whatever that thing is called, notepad or whatever on my mm -hmm. phone. And, uh, or the Evernote. Evernote, right, yeah. And, because during the day, you'll be somewhere and you go, oh, that's an idea. And I'll, I'll keep it, my, I'll jot it down on my phone. And I probably do that three or four times a day still. And then later on, when I go to write my jokes, I'll, I'll go to my Evernote and, and go, what was that idea I had earlier? Oh, yeah, that thing. Whatever, you know. Right, right, right. Cool. Uh, Ellen, did you have a question for Brian? Well, first, uh, thank you so much for uh, participating in this. Sure, uh, sure. And I saw you at Flappers a year ago in L.A. It was just great. Oh, thank you. I love um, your place. You got a great view there. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes. Um, I want to try, you know, could I tell you my best joke, which, which is poop? And, and because you're an encyclopedic knowledge of jokes, <laughs> I want your honest opinion, whatever okay. that might be. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. No, remember, I, never, I, I remember I never laughed, so don't expect it. So that's I'll fine. Just, okay. I'm divorced. Mm -hmm. Every year I like to celebrate the anniversary of my divorce. I watch my wedding video backwards. It's like an undoing. First, you see the bouquet flying back into my hand. We take the rings off. We look at each other and say, do I? <laughs> <laughs> that's great that's great I'll, 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 I'll tell you I like that for several reasons one I've never heard a bit I've never heard anything like that which is great two so many times people tell me their jokes where you don't believe what they're saying do you know what I mean like it's such the setup is implausible so you're not on board for the punchline but that, but that setup is perfectly plausible. Do you know what I mean? There's no reason that you wouldn't celebrate your anniversary of your divorce. And watching your wedding video backwards is such a clever, funny idea. I love it. I think it's great. There you go. And you laughed at it, Brian. So I yeah. actually did. I, I had to preface it because the laughs have been beaten out of me at this point, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I get it. No, I, I get yeah. It. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, the do I is that's a wonderful. That's great, a, great. It it builds and it's a nice image. It's great. I love it. There Thank you, you so much. Thank sure. you. Sure. Keep up the good work. That's I love it. Thanks a lot. Don, Donna Moran. Hi. Yeah. Thank you so much, Brian. Very insightful. Um, is there are there any other women writers other than yeah. the one you mentioned? Yes, we have. Uh, I think we've got nine writers and three of them are women. So oh. pretty good. I mean, right. considering. Um, uh, it's better than most of the shows. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is, is that true? Right. Are, are most of the late night shows staffed by men? Um, it, it's, it's become, it used to be, when I started, it was almost solely men. Mm. And um, it's, you know, it's changed over the last 20 years, yes, I would say. But in fairness, in the old days, like if we had a job opening and we got 100 writing packets, maybe three of them would be at women. So right. it's a 97% chance a man's going to be hired. So and, and now, 
yeah. now it's much more even. Always, there have always been women, like Rose Marie on the, the uh, Dick Van Dyke show was a woman writer. And uh, Carol Liefer, didn't she write for? Sure. Uh, for uh, she wrote for Seinfeld, yeah. And yeah, I think she, she, she writes for Dave too, I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah. uh, you know, Meryl Marco used to write for Dave. Yeah, yeah. Meryl Marco, right, yes, right. Yeah. Very good. Sure. She, didn't she, write, she came up with the top 10 list, I think, or she was one of the people that came up. Oh, with wow, it. okay, I, I'm not surprised. She's really very creative and very yeah. funny. Uh, Joyce, did you have a question? Hi, uh, nice to meet you, and again, nice thank you for your time. And sure. um, you have a couple math teachers, at least on here, and we've heard, I guess, you know, a lot of people in comedy either have a math background or in terms of how it relates to joke writing, it's, so it has a formula. Were you hmm. good at math? And then I know you alluded that you liked the Dick Van Dyke show, but was there anyone else who really inspired you? Like, I want to do this comedy thing. Um, well, I loved Rodney Dangerfield. Mm -hmm. And and I used to listen to I hate to say it now but I I mean I it's kind of up, but I loved Woody Allen albums and I used to listen to those. Mm -hmm. um, I liked Bob Newhart's persona, but I think um, but I loved the, the jokes that Woody Allen did and and Rodney Dangerfield did. Um, it's funny. There's a woman I worked with before at Conan who was like a math whiz and she was a good monologue writer. I was actually an English major, so. Um, but I, I think that there is a joke writing, there's a sort of a brevity and there's a crispness that's almost like a math problem, I think for some, it depends on how your mind works, but I think that there needs to be a certain logic to the joke, I guess. Right, right, and yeah, right, and there's, um, there's, a, there's a disproportionate number of lawyers in comedy, from my experience. Yes, there are, there are a lot of lawyers. And I wonder, I think there's a lot of teachers and there's a lot of lawyers. And I think some of it is those people are just comfortable being in front of, in front of crowds. That is true. But like, like I'm thinking of some, some of these uh, lawyers turned comedians in particular uh, make very logical arguments as part of their jokes, right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's how their brain works. Yeah, I would, you yeah. know, um, yeah, absolutely. So, so to your point, Joyce, I mean, I think um, if you were a, a philosophy, if you study philosophy, you're going to study logic, right? And there are rules to logic that are very similar to math. Yeah. And that's probably how it applies. In good but Greg Geraldo was a lawyer and... Um, right. I work, yeah. Um, you know Al, Al, Al Lubell. And, yeah, Al Lubell. Like and Sweeney, I, who works on our show. Yeah. I know Al Lubell very well, and I got to know him very well. And uh, what an extraordinary, I mean, amazing... Uh, it was like a puzzle. He was solving puzzles all the time. Yes, yes. Right. I do think you also have to be a little bit uh, obsessive. Yeah, well, he he was that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I think I think I think being obsessive can be a problem in life, but it can also, for joke writing, it's a good way to be. This is true. This Thank is you. True. Excellent. Sure. Right. Anyone else have a question? Uh, Ziggy has another question. Go ahead, Ziggy. It's almost a follow-up to the first one. If you didn't have to worry about giving jokes to Conan and you were on stage, would you be doing one-liners or would you be talking more about your family and personal stuff? Like I've heard some people say, the one-liner thing, that's old school, forget about it. Now it's, it's all personal stuff. How do you feel about that? Well, I do think that the, uh, if you watch a lot of late night stuff now, it has become more about the narrative. And, you know, the problem is it's very hard like I see people that are great storytellers and things like that. I just don't know how to do that. So, um, it, it, you know, I've had to kind of go with my strengths, which is just joke writing. And, and early on, I tried to do some observational bits or stories and things like that. I just wasn't good at that. Um, I do think now, if you watch a lot of late night sets, a lot of times it's more about their personal story and you know, sometimes you have a comic in there from Syria and it's like, oh, I'm glad they got out, but you're not necessarily laughing that much. <laughs> right. <laughs> that, that's an interesting point. Right. Or, uh, 
you know, what uh, Kimmel's kind of famous for in the last couple of years is like crying during his monologue. I don't know if you're familiar. Oh, is that, does that work? Uh, well, <laughs> it, get, it gets immediate attention. He, he basically cries about how, uh, how much he hates Donald Trump. But he literally goes, gets to tears sometimes. Uh, and it makes the news. I'm glad wow. you don't. I'm glad you haven't seen it because I don't know. Did did someone pitch that in the meeting? I guess that's the thing. I would, you know, had the same thought. Uh, let me let me ask you. I know uh, again. I'm sure that it it's evolved, but you know, like Carson would have sketches where he'd have he'd come out and be like the Vegematic guy, or he'd do sure. a parody, and it would all be on the stage and all live and usually involved big breasted women. And that was like his thing. Uh, are you writing sketches or I, I know that there are pieces where Conan does behind the scenes stuff and he's- uh, Yes, what will happen is, so I'll go in every day, like normally, I mean, pre-pandemic, uh, you know, Laurie and I would go in and we'd, we'd just work on the monologue from nine to 4.30. Right. But then once the show airs, then we would pitch some sketch ideas after that. So if our sketch got picked, uh, they would pair us with one of the sketch writers to produce it or whatever. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So, and because sometimes we just didn't have time because we had to write that day's monologue, so we couldn't right. hire actors and do the sketch and whatever, you know. Right. So it's so it's it's rather siloed what you do. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. And well, that's interesting to know. But it is it is fun to come up with a sketch every now and then, yeah. Right. Well, may I ask? Uh, you you're currently producing this show, uh, and is it is it? And I haven't watched it. I, I'll make a if I can stay up that late. I'll make a point to watch. It. <laughs> but is Conan doing it from home? Uh, how is it happening now? Uh, well, I don't know what you mean by me producing the show, but. Um, no, I mean, I mean, uh, is the show currently on? Are you doing shows? Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. And he's That's yeah. He's, so he's doing it from his. We're pitching him ideas, and he's doing our jokes and our things. It's all from his camp, from his phone, from home. Really. So yeah, so we have to pitch things that that he can shoot by himself at his house, you know. And are you guys? Um, I'm, and again, this might bore a lot of people in here, but the logistics of that, are, are there um, technical people helping him at home? Or? Well, you know, they, they, he's isolated. So they will, um, I don't know how it works in terms of he'll shoot something and send it to our editor and that editor will edit the piece, I guess, at home or I don't know, because right. the WB lot is closed. So they must be editing somehow at home right so and, and, uh, are you guys doing zoom meetings and in, in, in yeah wow. yeah that, i was late because our zoom meeting ran late okay, so there you go and that's why we all had, we all ended up putting silly names on our thing that i don't even know what my name says now but yeah uh, i could tell you it's iphone u m u g oh yeah 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 <laughs> i don't know it probably is something very <laughs> funny but it's it's, it's, it's <laughs> Um, okay, so does anyone else have a question for Brian? Uh, Brian Heather, do do Heather. The Tarzana Treatment Center next week. Uh, oh. <laughs> okay. Heather. Yes. All right, did you want to ask Brian a question? Yeah. Hi, Brian. Hello. I don't see you anymore. Oh, can you see me? Okay, oh, there oh. you are. Sorry. Um, hi. So. The whole thing about, you know, you have to know people. So what if you don't, because you're not in LA or, you know, you don't have connections and you want, how do you get your foot in the door? Uh, well, you know, we do live in a very connected society now. So there was, have, there was a woman named Megan Amram. Have you ever heard of her? No. So she... She was, she was one of the first, she was in a, she had this Twitter account that she was creating great joke after great joke. 
And so people noticed her Twitter account and she ended up getting hired for, t uh, for writing for television just based on her Twitter. So there are things now where, you know, you can produce something on twi you know, Twitter or Instagram or TikTok or YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people are able to create good content from their home and get it out to the world. And if things get retweeted and reposted and re whatever, people kind of can, you can kind of build up a little bit of a name for yourself with that. Right. So it's, it's a different world now because of technology. Yeah, absolutely. Go viral. Go viral. Yeah. So get, you get some viral videos out there and somebody will notice you. Right. Uh, before, before the pandemic, again, forgive me for not watching religiously. Don't be soon. Uh, but are, are stand-ups still part of the show? Conan, does Conan still feature stand-up comedy? We still feature stand-ups and they tend to uh, they like they like to put a lot of people are on for their first time on television. Really? Yeah. A lot of first timers. A lot of first timers, and um, and I will say it, it's it it's often a uh, it, a lot of it's about the their their personal narrative now. I do think that that has. So if I'm if I'm somebody so like. I'm a white male, heterosexual, middle-aged guy. They would be interested in hearing from me. <laughs> My narrative is so, you know. No, no I, I, yeah, I mean, I do. What they want. Right, but, right. Yeah. But, but the, yeah. Right. No, but sometimes, sometimes someone breaks through because they're unique and you know whatever. But I, but. Um, that, you know what? You want to hear me gripe? I'll gripe a little bit. You, you know, are you familiar with the Brady Bunch? Remember the Brady Bunch? Sure. And you remember um, that uh, they used to be a singing group as a family, right? Sure. And then, and then there was this one episode where this fancy hip record producers tried to get Greg Brady to break from the group and oh. do a solo career. You might remember this. And uh, the whole gist of it was because he fit the suit, right? They wanted to create this character named Johnny Bravo. They didn't even care. They would mm -hmm. do effects on his voice because he fit the suit. Huh. You know what I mean? So it's like that narrative, if they fit the narrative, boom. All right, so that's me griping. I'm not going to no, no, that's true. But I do, think, I do think it's a mistake to try to chase after what they like. I think you just have to be yourself and and do the best you can. And I do think if you if you're out there getting laughs every night and killing, somebody will want to put you on something. Right. Yeah. Right, right, right. Um so okay, uh, did someone else have a question? I think someone else had a question. Ziggy had another question. Ziggy no, he's He's trying to get his zoom off because I'm, I'm mute off. <laughs> okay. In, in, in general, would you say in terms of the performers who come on the show and in terms of the writer's room, is it really mostly for young people? And it, it, it's a young person's field, both as a performer and as a writer. They're, you know, mostly that's what they're looking for. Well, I do think that there is a certain amount of ageism in the business. I, I wish there, there weren't. Um, and, it, you know, it affects me in terms of trying to get other things to, you know, um, but, you know, it's, ironically, I do think, I do think actually becoming older actually puts you in a protected group, <laughs> you know, so that can turn out to be, I do think, I think that it's not so much your age, there are some, there are some older comics that are doing bits that you go, you know, you just can't do that anymore, if you know what I mean. And comedy has changed, society has changed. And I see comics that do bits that used to kill in the 80s and they don't fit the world anymore and they're still doing them. But then I see comics like, you know, I'll work with Rich Scheidner or someone like that, who's an older comic. He's got funny new stuff 
it's relevant. It's not, it's not dated. It's, it's great, you know? So you can be an older comic and still be hip, I guess. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Sure, sure. Uh, so, uh, what was the question? I just had, a, I really had a great question for you. I forgot it. Uh, Tim, Tim Thompson. Hi, uh, Brian. First, I want to thank you for your service. <laughs> Appreciate it. I like your haircut. Uh, thank you. Where do you see late night talk shows going in the next 10 years? What's the future? Um, well, I would say one thing. Like, So our show went from an hour to a half hour. And I could see that becoming a trend because in the old days, you know, they were trying to kill time. You know, they, they, they had a certain amount of time to fill. And I think now with Netflix and with, you, you know, YouTube and everything like that, uh, there's no need to try to kill time. You know, there's, there's so many, people have so many options of so many things to watch. So um, I could see a lot of shows going through a half hour format. I do think that the topical nature of late night shows makes it a desirable thing because, you know, if something happens that day, if Trump talks about, you know, injecting Lysol in your blood, whatever, people want to see that made fun of that night, that kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So that's one thing that sitcoms can't do is have that respond every day to what's going on. Um, but I do think the days of watching uh, a host talk to some actor that you never heard of and they're telling the host what they had for breakfast, there's too many things to watch. We don't give a shit. Do you know what I mean? So... I think people would rather see, I think Conan decided it's like, hey, let's do some funny topical comedy and then I'll talk to Tom Hanks or Tina Fey and that's our show. And and why have why why have stuff that no one's interested in, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So um I know you said that they have a lot of comics are making their debut on Conan. Is there like a Jake Johansson, someone that's been on a hundred times that Conan really likes having on? Um, well, like like Kevin Nealon will be on. Nealon, do we stand up? Will Nealon do stand up every time? No, he'll come and sit on the, uh, he'll sit on the couch and be the guest. But a lot of those comics, they're basically doing their act on the couch. You know what I mean? Right. Um, but why, but why do you like Nealon so much? You know. Well. He works with them at SNL. Okay. And, you know, he's such a funny guy. And I think Conan always liked him. And I also, you know, um, so I do think, you know, uh, there are some veteran comics like that that Conan loves that will still be on. But um, does, Nor does Norm McDonald still appear on the show? Uh, he hasn't in a while. I don't know why. I, he was always really funny and Conan really likes him. I I, I don't know what's up with Norm. Sometimes what happens with, and I don't know this to be the case with Norm, but sometimes what happens is somebody ends up, somebody has a friendship with Kimmel or Fallon or something like that, and they just do their show. So right. I, I don't know if Norm's doing one of the other shows, right. but uh, he hasn't been on in a bit, and I, I always think he's hilarious. Right, but it, it, I mean, he is, it, he is famous for that most, the, the funniest, uh, panel thing ever, with, yeah, with the with the with the carrot top movie. Yeah, right? that was great. That, that was, was great. Like the most yeah. incredible. If you've never seen it? Go look up Conan Norm Macdonald. Yes, and he did a funny bit where he played Sully Sullenberger in a movie, but it was <laughs> it was it was before he landed in the Hudson, so it's just him landing safely at the airport in Kansas City or something. It was right, right. <laughs> Hilarious. There's, there's, there's really nobody like Norm, really. Yeah, he's really funny. He's really funny. But uh, like I said, that, that, that what you're saying, the days of the sitting on the couch doing the panel stuff is, is probably... Uh, well, the days of, you know, Carson would bring on unknown actresses and unknown, you know, especially by the third or fourth guest, you know, you were having some you know, I think the days of having, the problem is there's too many shows. 
So a lot of times for the second guest, it's like, well, who is that person? They're like, oh, they're on such and such a show. It's like, I never heard of that show. Do you know what I mean? Like right. when we were kids, there were three networks. You knew who all the TV stars were, even if you didn't happen to watch that show, you know? Right, right, right. So, okay. So um, somebody else have a question? Joyce has another question. As we're talking about age and all these things, um, I just looked up, I, I know, I think Conan had a background in improv or de definitely a lot of, uh, you know, experience with that. So in terms of your show now, like, obviously, if you're joke writing or sketch writing, there's more of an element of control there versus improv. Is there ever uh, room for improvisation in your kind of format? Or do they stay strictly to the script? Uh, that's a good question. It's usually... Um, We'll have some sketches that kind of go off the rails a little bit, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, it's good to have, some, you know, we have a lot of sketch performers on our show and improv. And so they usually have an improv background. So sometimes if the sketch goes off the rails, they'll kind of go with it. Mm -hmm. um, and as opposed to an actor who's like, wait, I only say my line, you know. So they'll kind of know, okay, this has gone off the rails here and they'll kind of go with it. So that, that having that type of uh, training does come in handy, I would say. And I, I mean, you also look at shows now like Curb Your Enthusiasm and so, there's some other shows that it's all, uh, it's, a lot of it's improv, right. you know? Okay. Right. Thank okay. you, Brian. Sure, sure. Um, someone else have a question? Uh, Ziggy, go ahead. Could, could you talk about how great it was and what it, how Conan got The Tonight Show and how horrible it was when Jay Leno kicked him off and, and took it back? <laughs> wait, what, wait, what let me make it? sure. I, I got to check TMZ if, they're, if they've got a live hotline. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was all those things. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean... You know, I, I guess I don't know what to say about that. It, it just, um, it was an unfortunate thing and it was a blow to us and, and it caught, totally caught us off guard. But, um, you know, I think what happens in our show sometimes is people come on and they reference that to Conan and Conan will kind of say something and move on and then some critical on, on the well saying oh Conan is still talking about that it's like he's not talking about that you know what I mean right somebody else brought it up um so I think people think that we're we're in our offices still stewing about that 10 years later or whatever and it's like you know we've we've got a show that we love and we're just enjoying doing that and and I don't think we really I don't think any of us are really dwelling on on the past like that you know and, 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 and I think Jay has finally found his stride with the car show. Well, you know, I, I'm assuming he loves that. I, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, he's, he's, uh, it's a pretty good, it's actually, I, it's one of the few things I watch on YouTube pretty regularly. He's pretty good. He's really good at that. He really is. Well, good. he's, yeah, I know he's, a, I know he's a car nut, so I'm sure he's, he's great nut. at it. He's a car now. I'm sure you see him driving around Los Angeles all the time. I, I do see him once in a while driving around. You know, he's always in a crazy car, so yeah. Right. Can uh, I ask a quick question? Sure. How do you jump? Are there days, you know, where you want to might feel the need to jumpstart your creativity a little or just, I'm uh, not trying to ask anything personal, but it just in terms of technique or process, when you want to get the wheels turning again and the juices flowing, how do you do uh, that? Well, that's a good question. I, I, there are some exercises that I'll do. One thing sometimes I'll do is, especially if I'm just writing for my act, for myself, I'll just write down a bunch of true statements with no joke, just, just a bunch of true statements. Or sometimes I'll, I'll write down a bunch of areas, like um, going to the dentist or, you know, um, visiting my son at college or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Just a bunch of areas. And then sometimes, which I think there's gotta be something funny about this or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Um, I sometimes will flip through the dictionary 
and look at a bunch of words and see something and that triggers a joke. Um, so I do that from time to time. Thank you. You know, to sure. that point, Brian, um, when, you, when you go into the office, you drive into the office, you're there, I guess, five days a week or whatever. Yeah. You get there at nine o'clock, you make your coffee, uh, and you're sitting in your office. I, I mean, are there days where you're just staring at a blank screen and nothing is coming to you? Sure, sure. But, I, you know, it's luckily now there, there, you know, there's so many news sites. You can go to CNN and USA Today and Google News and Newser and BBC.com and ABC News and CBS, all those things. You know what I mean? Right. So if you just keep digging, then you usually see something that you go, okay, this, I can have fun with this. Okay. So you, so you try to make it, uh, you want to, you want to be amused is, this is a good question. I thought of one. If something amuses you, that is where you'll go, right? If you think, if you have a thought, it goes, that's funny. You don't think about, oh, people will think this is funny. I think this is funny. Well, I do think there's something, there's a lot to be said, and, and I do feel like this with stand-up too, that you have to think it's funny first. If you're writing a joke that you think, I don't think this is funny, but they'll like it, I think that's a bad way to go. And I've known comics that had strong acts that didn't like their act. They go, oh, I don't like my act. It does well. I don't like it. It's like, that must be torture to go on and do an act that you don't like, you know? So um, I, I also think, you know, sometimes when you're looking at the news, some of the topics, either they're too depressing or they're too dry. You know, if it's about unemployment figures or the NASDAQ or something, it's like, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's comedy. So you want something that's a fun area, you know? Uh, Janet. Uh, first, thanks so much, Brian, for uh, sure, sure. You know, being so generous with your time. And I've learned a lot here. I just was wondering, like, what type of things block you at times and then how do you go about unblocking like if you've got to go into work and you've got to you know you've got to write up these you know jokes and these monologues and then you come in and you're just in like a funky mood you know like how do sure. you get out of that and get into what you need to get into um sometimes sometimes i'll put down some jokes that just to get going, just to have something on the page, I'll put down some jokes that I know are lame just to get me going. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. you can't just sit sometimes and just wait for the perfect joke. It's like, all right, this is a stupid one, but let me put it down and get it out of my head and then go on to the next one, that kind of thing. Um, I do think that there's, you know, there was some uh, Philip Roth book with a, with a character as an author, and he was saying that, that, uh, amateurs wait for inspiration and professionals just write. So you do have, you do, it's like anything else, you're just building up that muscle. Mm -hmm. So you know you can sit down and in an hour you're going to write 12 jokes or whatever just because you do it every day and you know how to do that. Does do that make sense? You? Yes, that's awesome. And that was a great quote. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, Brian, forgive me if I'm wrong about this because I read your bio a couple of times. And you're very, um, what's the word? Uh, I'm bald. Yeah, you're bald. <laughs> so, so, uh, you've, writ you've written other things than jokes, right? Have you written I have, yeah. I, I, be between The Tonight Show and The, the New Show, I, I actually wrote a novel, yeah. So do you, do you, what was that experience like? How was it different from writing material? Oh, it was, you know, because I had always... I had always thought of in terms of television and I've got to write clean and it's got to be this and it's got to be, you know, whatever. And writing a novel for me was very liberating because I had characters. It was very dark, which I didn't know it was going to, I didn't know it was going to write so dark. Okay. I would swear if I needed to swear, I just, I just didn't, I didn't have any sort of um, restrictions or whatever. So it was very liberating for me. Yes. So what, was the book published? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, you can get it on Amazon. What's it called? 
It's called The Astounding Misadventures of Rory Collins. Oh, that's easy to remember. See that? <laughs> <laughs> and you guys, you might be, just, you can just put in my name and it'll pop up. Rory, uh, Rory, Rory Collins. Rory yeah. Collins. Okay, cool. And it makes and it, it, it made Philip Roth blush. Is that what it says on the <laughs> makes Philip Roth blush? That's Especially now. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Heather. Can you hear me, Heather? So I just wanted to ask Brian. Yeah, you can't hear me? You no, hear you. Now you hear me, we hear you now. Now we can. Unmute yourself. Now, now we see the other side, your other camera on your iPad. You got All right. right. All right. I was trying to get just to see Brian. Okay. Oh, sorry. Sorry. That's okay. That's okay. Hi again. So if Conan ended tomorrow, what would you do? Um, That's not too oh. Um, uh, I would move to a smaller house. No, no. Um, I think I would, you know, I, I took a pilot writing class about three years ago. So I would try to, um, get one of my scripts out there and see if I could get hired on a sitcom. Right. right. I so might be me, too old. I don't know. Well, let me say this. I mean, I mean, from, from most of us, from the point of view from most people who don't work on major television shows, you're sitting really in the catbird seat, aren't you, as far as making connections in the industry? Well, the, I, mean, I do think, uh, you know, every show, everyone's kind of in their own bubble. So you, you're really not mingling. Like, I know very few sitcom writers or other show writers because we're not all hanging out. We're all in our own offices, right? In our own shows. So, it really during the during the writers' strike, I actually got to meet some other writers uh, <laughs> on the picket line. But normally, everyone's everyone's in their own little rabbit holes. So, oh. um, yeah, we don't we don't get to to mingle very much at all. Um, yeah, Ooh. but you know, I I would I, if Conan ended, I'd I'd go back and I'd just do stand up and. I'd try to get hired um, on a sitcom or something else. And, and Domino's is hiring. I saw that. <laughs> they need people. Um, who, is, who have you been most impressed with, me, uh, celebrities that have been on the show that you went, wow, I can't believe I'm looking at this guy or that girl? Well, you know, I, I got to meet Ted Williams and I, I've, I got to meet Tom Hanks. So I, I there's a couple, yeah, I got to meet Bob Newhart, who was a hero of mine, and Dick right. Van Dyke, I got to meet him, so that was great. Um, I'll tell you one story, when my kids are about eight and 10, um, Henry Winkler has, had written these children's books for kids that age, and my kids loved them. Yeah. So I usually don't meet the guests because I don't have anything interesting to say to them, but I really want to have, I made a point to meet Henry Winkler and just to tell him, because I, if I went up to him and said, hey, the Fonz, I'm sure he'd be like, oh, my God, not, you know. But I had a feeling that this was something near and dear to his heart, his children's books. And, you know, I had read some of them to my kids, and they loved them, and I just told them how much I appreciated his kids' books. And unbeknownst to me, he got my address from our producer, and about a week later in the mail, we got three books from him that were signed to my kids and so on. Oh, okay. So... It's very nice. It's very nice. So, I always say he was my favorite guest when people ask me. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right, we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up in a minute or two. So, is there anyone that has a last question that they'd like to ask, Mr. Kylie? Do you have a favorite joke, either one of your own, that you're particularly proud of, or it's particularly dear to you? Or another joke that you've heard that you treasure would give us, you know, one of your very favorites? Um, I guess uh, there's a couple, uh, you know, there are jokes from my act that are near and dear to my heart. I think there are a couple of jokes I liked for Conan when I was first there. One of my first jokes I ever got on, uh, Prince Charles' dog had run away and they were looking, <laughs> was missing. And we said, he, 
Uh, he's got a brown and white coat and floppy ears. Uh, no word on what the dog looks like. <laughs> <laughs> and because that was one of my first jokes I got on, that, that always stuck with me. That's a great joke. That's a fantastic joke. Uh, Debbie, I have a question if it wasn't asked already. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Is that really your bookcase behind you, or is that just a? Uh, uh, yeah, sorry. This is my this is my little study. Wonderful. Um, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Put the candle back. No, no, no. I, I had to plug in my phone next to the thing, so I usually don't use this as my backdrop. Sorry. No, that's 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 wonderful. Well, Brian, it, it's been a, it's been an extraordinary pleasure to have you join us today. We well, I had so much fun, and you know what? I will. I have to say, the fact that you guys have this group, and that you're that you work together is such an important thing. It's really it's good to be part of a community. Thank uh, you. It's, it's so hard to be successful in comedy by yourself, so it's great that you have this. Um, what, I love it. Thank you so much. We really enjoy Thanks, it. Brian. We really enjoy having having had you and uh, other folks to like you. On. Sure, sure. I hope to meet you guys in person sometime. Yeah, right. When you're in New York, um, look us up. I said hi. And we, okay, have some, we have some LA people here. We have. Yeah, yeah. I know Chris is there. And, and uh, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, and I think I've met, yeah, I've right. met one or two before. All right. Well, nice okay. to meet you guys. Right, it was nice Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. All right, guys, we're going to do this again tomorrow morning at 10. So anybody that's interested, please keep your eyes out for the email. It'll go out sometime tonight or early tomorrow. Okay? Thanks so Thanks. much. Thanks, Rob. Right. Good night, everybody. See you, see you on Monday. That's my next time I'll be on. All right. Okay. See you, Richard. <laughs>